Dr. Stephen Hassan, uh, welcome to your undivided attention. Thank you, Tristan and Aza. It's a, it's a real honor to be with you today. Well, uh, you know, it's a, it's a real honor for us, too, because back when we launched this podcast, Your Undivided Attention, in June 2019, we actually promised our listeners that we would be talking to cult deprogramming experts. And we failed to deliver on that promise until today, two and a half years approximately later. And, you know, the reason, actually, that this was always in our agenda to talk about cult deprogramming is, is actually that... There's so many dynamics of the way that social media works that mirror some of the social manipulative processes that occur in cults. And um, many listeners actually may not know this, and Steve, I don't know if you knew this, but I, I actually spent about three years going, um, kind of touring different cults from the outside, going to large group awareness trainings, going into different groups. I had many friends in the Bay Area who were uh, part of and participating in various new age cults. Aza would hear of my stories when we would, I would talk about these various groups I would join. And see, the thing I, I'm so excited to get into with you is that people really underestimate the degree to which psychological influence can work in an invisible way, regardless of intelligence, regardless of PhD level. In fact, there's many of the ways that social media acts like a cult factory. It, it identifies these buckets of human behavior that are similar, you know, the people who are clicking on flat earth videos or the people who are clicking on, you know, various political tribe videos and then pulling you deeper and deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. And so what we're really excited to just speak with you about today is um, the dynamics of how cults work. Uh, and then we'll get hopefully all the way into a conversation about um, the techniques of cult deprogramming, because I think if there's any discipline that is most needed right now to reverse our way out of the mind warp of the last 10 years of psychological derangement, it's the discipline of cult deprogramming. So I'm, we're just incredibly excited to talk to you today about um, you know, everything you've got to offer. Thank you. And ultimately, I believe if you're an adult, you should be in control of your own mind and not uh, turning over your power, getting rid of your conscience, your critical thinking, and, and having blind faith and having certainty that your doctrine is the truth with a capital T, no matter what it is. Yeah, know? and maybe just to mark for listeners that, um, you know, while you have written a book called The Cult of Trump, I think that there are cults on all sides of the different political aisles, obviously to different degrees, and people are going to argue about that. But I, I want to mark that explicitly because I think one of the actual challenges of cult deprogramming is the belief that those who are being accused of being in a cult get very defensive, right? And just to name that no matter which group you might be a part of or which set of beliefs we might touch upon, um, try to come to this conversation, if you're a listener, you know, with an open mind about um, really just studying what are the processes that have us go more and more extreme into a set of self-reinforcing beliefs and groups. And, and what would it take to kind of liberate us? So maybe, uh, Steve, just to warm our listeners up for a bit to understand your personal story sure. and how you got um, recruited into the Moonies. Um, who were you back then? And what were the steps along the way that uh, got you recruited? I know this is sort of setting the table for oh, listeners, but. My story is um, not un that unusual, actually. I got, a, I was victimized by a honey trap I grew up in a very um, middle, middle class uh, Jewish household in Flushing, Queens. I was not a joiner. I was introverted. I wrote poetry and short stories. That was my major in college. I worked as a banquet waiter at a Holiday Inn in Hempstead while I was going to college to make my money. I was in the last draft lottery go to the Vietnam War. I, so I was very... Uh, disillusioned with what I had been taught growing up about, you know, fighting communists. When I realized that this was an unjust war and that the government has been lying to us, I was like, I'm just not interested in wanting to make the world a better place. My girlfriend had dumped me abruptly over the Christmas break at college. I was an upper junior. I was blue starting the new semester. I was sitting in the cafeteria of Queens College and three very attractive women asked if they could share my table with me and were flirting with me. And I was like, wow, uh, sure, here, sit on down. And I had a whole pile of college textbooks that I had purchased for the next semester. I think I had uh, Heidegger's Being in Time and a book on the Upanishads and a whole bunch of other philosophy course that I was taking. 
and they just asked me a billion questions and I was so happy to tell them all about me. And I want to mark this part of my story, if I may, for your listeners, because back in the 70s, and I want to add, this was February of 1974. So the whole idea of cults was not mainstream, you know, at all. But back then, you needed to elicit information about people directly from them. So tell me about your family. What does your father do? Oh, he has a hardware store that he took over from his father. What does your mother do? Oh, she teaches art for eighth grade. Do you have siblings? Yes, I have two older sisters. So they elicited everything about who I was and what was important to me. These days, all of this data is now being collected online and is being used by agents, you know, bad agents, good agents, whatever, to sell us products or to recruit us into cults. And if I take, right. may take one more minute, when I was a Mooney recruiter, and that's part of the story is they recruited me into a front group through deception. But when I was a Mooney recruiter, I was told to, to sort people into thinkers, feelers, doers, or believers. And the idea was their lead thing. Like if someone says, you know, I'm a strong Christian, I pray every day, there was going to be a different recruitment scenario developed for that person versus someone who's like, I'm an atheist, but I, you know, I want to fix the world and help starving children. Different angle. But back to my, my cult story, if I may. So they asked me all this information. Then they were like, we would love to get to know you better. You're so special and you're so wonderful. What's known as love bombing, which online is called swarming, I believe. They were just love bombing me up and I was lapping it up because, wow, attention from three attractive women. And I do remember asking them, are you students? Yes. Uh, are you part of a religious group? No. Right. And uh, I, I did. They looked me straight in the eye. And that's another thing I want to share with your listeners. My dad, who is a hardware store owner in Ozone Park, was like, Steve, you can always tell if someone's shady, they won't look you straight in the eyes. Like that was that was how I was inoculated by my dad. Right. People in cults are actually very good at actually looking you directly and in the eye. And they were very sincere. And I learned and later, as I was helping people get out of Scientology, I learned they were actually drilling people to stare people in the eyes wow. and, and, and not blink, et cetera. Well, actually, just, just to mark a few cult. things, because I think it's nice to interactively sure. kind of go back and forth and, and name some of the features of what pulled you in. Because sure. the first thing I heard you say is the Vietnam War is happening. And there's a disenchantment with government is part of that which preceded um, maybe going into something. Because I think there's some similar processes now, right? There's mass disenchantment with you know a lot of the systems that have run our society uh, that's one thing i heard you say another thing i heard you say is the um uh, affirmation and love bombing from and lots of attention from a attractive uh women um and you know yep. just to make this concrete for listeners with social media you know if i'm designing a social media product the first thing i want to do when you enter is say boom, you're so special. What your, your interests are really special to us. We're going to give you all of these things. In fact, we're going to show you the most attractive people on here when you first open that TikTok app. We're going to yep. show you the most attractive, uh, either men or women, just to sort of make some parallels for listeners, then I'd love for you to keep going. Yeah, attractiveness is important, but identification is even more important that you're meeting people who are like you or people that you right. can really relate with. Right. And so as a recruiter, if we knew someone was like a disaffected Catholic from, you know, uh, the Bronx and we had a disaffected Catholic from the Bronx, we would make sure to introduce them to each other. Wall Street Journal did a great video about the TikTok algorithm that just, you know, when you swipe a couple things and it actually tests like, hey, do, is it the religious videos that work with you? Is it the dancer videos? Is it the soft porn videos for the, you know, and, and it figures out which of these things work. And so just that matching, Steve, that you're talking about of making sure that we have people who look like me because the creature brain inside of us, I'm taking my neurolinguistic programming knowledge out here. You know, the creature brain is saying, am I with like kind? Am I with people who look like me? Yeah. And that's what creates that trust. What exactly is a cult? How do you define like undue influence? What differentiates like brainwashing versus persuasion versus mind control? versus influence um, because I think it's easy to, it, it, I could imagine 
a question arising in our listener's mind, which is, okay, um, how is this not all relative? How is it not that there's a cult of the mainstream and then each one of these cults is like a, a different kind of right belief in their own right? How, how do you even know what a cult is? And I think if we can like go right to the heart of that question, that'll help the rest of this conversation land much more strongly. Yeah, so um, I would like to start. I have what's called an influence continuum graphic, which is on my Freedom of Mind dot com site and it basically talks about ethical influence so on one end of the continuum the unethical influence and so for me there are cults that are on the ethical end <laughs> and authoritarian cults that are on the unethical end so when people say ethical cults what are you talking about so for me there are some behavioral uh, criteria that's that helps flesh that out and people can self-assess. And I refer to the, the four overlapping components as control of behavior, control of information, control of thoughts, and control of emotions. Uh, I refer to as the bite model of authoritarian control. And the more a group or person controls your behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions to make you over in their image or to have a pseudo identity that's obedient and dependent that's my definition of an authoritarian cult versus an ethical cult where you know what you're getting involved with you have informed consent you're encouraged to read whatever you want to read talk to critics talk to former members challenge authority and you're free to leave without phobias that have been put in your mind that you're going to get hit by a car or get cancer or be possessed by demons or go to hell or whatever. Um, and so by having a frame uh, based on human rights, based on, you know, I'm an adult. These women who said they weren't part of a religious cult, but they were going back to the center, bowing to an altar with Moon and his wife's picture on it, reciting a pledge to die for the Moonies cult, that was a lie. These are the warning flags, because if something's legit, it will stand up to scrutiny. I say it over and over. The burden is on them to prove that they have this great thing, not on us to disprove it. I actually would like to double click on each of those because, okay, if we're, if we're starting to define cults as the ability to uh, influence behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions. And if you're saying, Steve, that those are the critical ingredients, could you give some specific examples? And if you could maybe um, to do it through stories that actually happened uh, in the Moonies as you were getting recruited, because I think that would help ground people in what it means to be tapping into those things. So just, just to say one last thing, I think that if we can make a match to how social media is enabling the exact same manipulation on those four different axes that you're talking about to even a more precise degree than you experienced or anyone experiences in a cult, I think we're starting to make the case that um, there is a, um, a mirroring and a matching and an even an extension of a supercharging of those, those capacities. Supercharging is absolutely the right word. And as your work has so uh, ably demonstrated, where we're needing to use ethics and wisdom to try to get a handle on this technology because bad actors can use it for nefarious purposes and exploit people. Let's go back to the Moonies. So these women were flirting. They invited me over to meet their friends. I had a free dinner. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. There are people from all over the world that were sitting on the floor having, you know, eating with our paper plates. And, uh, okay, you know, nothing here for me. Uh, thanks, have a nice time. And I get my shoes on, I go out, it was snowing, to my car. And I don't know, a dozen people follow me out without jackets or shoes and surround my car. Hmm. And I'm like in a confused state, which is a technique of mind control, right? If you want to mind control someone, confuse them. And how do you confuse people? You do incongruent behaviors that are not normal scripts for how humans interact with each other. So it makes the normal person curious, like, what is going on? I was surrounded and people were like, we like you so much. 
well, you have to promise to come back tomorrow. We want to get to know you better. And I'm like, it's cold. Go inside. Like, <laughs> leave me alone. And they're like, no, we're not going to leave until you promise to come back. I'm serious. They actually, they actually did made you this. promise to come back. And <laughs> I, you know, I look back with 2020 hindsight, but they were so sincere and they were so nice and there was someone from harvard there was someone from princeton there mm -hmm. these were not dummies these were re these are interesting people but i was i was an introvert i was not into groups of any kind so but anyway i promised to come back and i i'm a man of my word mm -hmm. and that came back to haunt me again because after the second night, they were started with, we're going away this weekend. We're going to have a great time. We need you to come. And I'm like, I'm a banquet waiter. I work on the weekends. I've never had a weekend off for two years. Please stop asking me to come. I work. And they kept bugging me. And I said, okay, if I don't have to work some weekend, I'll, I'll go. And wouldn't you know, two days later, I call up my boss. Okay, when do I? When do you need me? He said, you won't believe it, but the wedding was called off. Take the weekend off. Hmm. So this is a, a very important point I want to share with your listeners because it turns out a lot of people get recruited into, into authoritarian cults because of some type of coincidence that just happens to mesh with what's happening in your life, and it's a it's it's a misattribution <laughs> of causality, right. and it mm -hmm. was like in my back of my head, this was weird. I I promised to go. I didn't want to go. My boss gave me the weekend off, but I gave my word. I gave my word, so I'm gonna. So go. there's a commitment device. There's almost a superstitious like, whoa, there's a coincidence here. Something's matching something else. Mm -hmm. There's a perfect timing, what they call Kairos. Of, uh, you know, the exact yes. match of, of when something comes at the time that you might want it. Yes. And I, I hear this all the time with people that I've helped where they were like, I was praying that morning for God to show me what I should do with my life and knock, knock the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, knocked on my door. So, of course, I let them in. And social media can play on that as well to talk about just to make a mirror for our listeners in terms of the re-engagement paradigm. There you are. You're leaving the your first night of dinner and you're like, okay, I'm done with this. But then they actually like love bomb you and kind of swarm you right as you're leaving. So now notice that let's say you're on Facebook or Twitter and you started your account and you only engaged a few times with a couple tweets and then you stop using it. Well, what do they do? Do they just yep. sit there and say, well, it was kind of nice to have Steve as a Twitter user for, for a day. We're just going to let him go. No, they get really aggressive. They start actually pounding you with, here's all this content you're going to miss. Here are these people that look like you. Oh, don't go. They'll literally use language with exclamation points saying, we're really sorry to miss you. We want you to come back. They 100%. use that kind of language. And it's not Facebook saying that. They put that in the, the coming from your friends. They'll show you faces of your friends that say, these people miss you. Come yeah, back. so this is, is uh, you're talking specifically about if I go into Facebook and say I want to delete my account, bef as you go through that flow and it says, are you sure you want to delete your account? It'll put up the f photos of, of five of the people you've clicked on the most. It calculates which faces of which friends can I put on this screen at, that are most likely to dissuade you from deleting your Facebook account. And they can calculate exactly which people. It would be like, hey, when you go out to that, when Steve is walking out to his car, which of these five people should we send to surround him? Should we send the Harvard people? Did he respond to them? Did he respond to appeals to authority and that credibility of the Harvard people? Or did he, strong, did he respond to those attractive girls? Or did he respond to, you know, and so you, you can play with it, right? But now social media is doing that to a level of precision and degree that is totally different. To answer your question about BITE, behavior, information, thought, and emotional control, I want to first just say I got the, the, this idea from Leon Festinger, who is a psychologist who wrote a book, Prophecy Failed, uh, in the 50s. And he talked about thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and how humans want congruity or consistency amongst these three elements of our lives. We don't like dissonance. So we will start reformulating things. So if we are asked to do an extreme behavior, we'll rationalize it in order to feel good about it. For me, the, the misattribution effect, and maybe I'm meant to go to, for this weekend, 
now I'm, I, I drive over to the Mooney house. They want me to go in their van. Big mistake, should have had my own car. But way before cell phones were invented, right? And now I'm going to a place I have no idea what the destination is. I haven't told my family or anyone you know, where I am other than I'm going off with some friends. Being driven into a multi-million dollar estate in Tarrytown and the, the guy at the front of the van says, oh, this weekend we're having a joint workshop with the Unification Church. To which I said, wait a minute, no one told me about a workshop and what's this thing about a church? I'm Jewish. And then they did the classic cult mind control technique of turning it around on the person that it's their fault. What's the matter, Steve? Are you closed-minded? Do you have an issue with Christians? All of a sudden now Steve's defensive <laughs> and I'm confused because I thought I was going to have fun with these women and meet friends and have a great time for the weekend and now all of a sudden it's a religious workshop and they told me it wasn't religious. I said, I want to leave. Drive me back. Well, so actually, I think this is important to double click on as well, which is um, how our hesitations um, actually get weaponized as examples of our lack of belief that of the very thing that we, we they want the cult wants you to do. Um, you know, an example is in a Tony Robbins workshop. One of the experiences is you you walk over these burning hot coals and that's meant to um, show yourself that you are capable of something impossible. You know, there you are, you're, you're afraid of doing something as, as, as dangerous as that. But, and, and there you, you see these, these huge flames. I mean, I actually did do it. And uh, uh, I think it was in Chicago, I did a, a workshop with Tony Robbins. And um, I was actually really afraid of doing it, right? I mean, people, there are stories um, that people who have burned their, their feet uh, walking on these burning yeah. hot coals. Um, but of course, people do it thousands and thousands of times over. And, and there is a way in which it works and it feels impossible. But if, you're, if you hesitate, it's used as kind of a, well, isn't this how you're hesitating and not showing up bravely for your life? But what I hope we're going to be doing for listeners is, is showing how, whether we're talking about Tony Robbins or Landmark or Est or the Moonies or whatever, I mean, they, they exist in very different parts of the continuum or coaching or, um, uh, you know, actual religions or, um, you know, political tribes. And there's, there's these features of... Um, your hesitation is examples of something that you need to fix about yourself. The power of certainty. You know, most people, until they've met a cult recruiter, have never experienced someone so confident and so certain that they know what they know, with a capital K, uh, what reality is and what's going on and what's best for you. And the average person has uncertainty. And so for me, whenever someone comes into my life who's super certain, I have warning, warning. <laughs> going off in my head because I want people who aren't that certain and are willing to change their mind and detach their ego from their beliefs because well, I'm willing to change my beliefs if there's evidence okay. that's convincing. So when we criticize or, or name any groups here, right, there's going to be people who are going to be offended, you know, say, um, you know, people who are, who are believers of various religions or you say Magistan or Wokistan. I mean, so this, everyone believes that they have the way, the one truth. And everyone believes that the other side, that we're awake, but it's the rest of the world that's not awake. You know, I just saw that at the conservative uh, political action conference, CPAC, uh, Ted Cruz was speaking and behind him was a big poster that said, awake, not woke. So they're saying that we're the awake ones because woke is the, the bad thing. But then the woke People on the left believe that they're the ones who are actually awake to the the actual history and the, and the you know the the roots of, of oppression that that we need to actually correct and fix, and and then even the matrix is used on both sides, right? And, and the right has kind of currently co-opted the phrase red pilling. Um, in the the film The Social Dilemma, I said, how do you wake up from the matrix when you don't know you're in the matrix? If you're pro vaccine, you're in a cult of not questioning whether the vaccine is actually. Uh, safe. But if you're anti-vaccine, the people who are pro-vaccine say you're in a cult of questioning the, the validity of something that's saving lives. So everyone is very certain. And that's just a ground for listeners. The stakes of this conversation is why it's so important. Right. If we don't have ways of waking up from the certainty, one of the, the basic tools that you need of just recognizing, how would I know if I was wrong? You know, um, what, what would, how, can I even, if I can't even send my mind there, that's probably proof 
that I'm I'm captured by something. Yeah, no, you you you're bringing up a really and critically important point because ultimately, the cure to blind faith is perspective, and developmentally, if you can't go a level up and look at both sides and the evidence for both sides and apply how did I arrive at this information, um, you're going to be very vulnerable to being sucked into one of one side or the other and come back to what what are my values, what are my my beliefs and how do I want to live my life? Can I look in the mirror at night, feel good about myself? Yeah.